Why Are You, a program run through the Ontario Provincial Advocate for Children and Youth, is a youth-led, youth-produced, and youth-engaged radio show that spotlights the stories of young people. The show airs every Thursday from 5.30 to 6 and covers a range of subject matter, from mental health to music. Here is a slice of a few past shows. Why are you? Why are you? Why are you? Why are you? On CJRU. The views expressed in this show do not necessarily reflect those of the Office of the Provincial Advocate for Children and Youth. Hey everyone, you're listening to Why Are You, a.k.a. Youth Radio United. My name is Mary Lou. I'm going to be your host for today. Earlier on in the week, I met with four different servers and I asked them for their thoughts and opinions on several things related to working in the restaurant industry as a server. How long have you been working in the restaurant industry? Bessie? Basically all my Canadian life. I started here in 1992, 1st of August. Ooh. <laughs> what drew you to the restaurant industry? I just like the freedom of not being stuck behind a desk. I tried that, I can't do it. I've worked in different offices and that's not for me. What do you think are the qualities that make a good server? Oh, that's interesting. Good server has, has a good heart. Well, you have to have a good memory. What do you think are the qualities that make up a good restaurant to work for? You can never choose the customers. So for me, I feel it's all about the management, how the management decides to work and manage not just the front of the house, but the back of house as well. Working as a server, the hours are very long. How have the hours impacted your life? Get very tired. I usually don't like to do too much after work because I'm really tired. I don't get a lot of things done that I need to be getting done. So when you're not tipped, do you think that restaurants should compensate for that? I don't know, because then people will just fall back on that. So I don't really think so. All over the Europe, actually, the tip is included in the bill. You don't have to tip extra at the end. It's just the owner give you at the end of the week the money, which are extra for your tip. Yeah, well, they need to realize sometimes it's just busy and you can't be everywhere at once. And some, most people are cool with that. Some people just don't see anybody else sitting here. Do you think that the government should change that system of where servers get paid lower than the minimum wage? Well, it's good and it's bad. I mean, when you're busy and you make money, it's fantastic. But when it's dead, I mean, you're working for under $10 an hour, which is kind of sucky, but I actually just rather keep it that way than be strictly hourly based. So, Vessi, when you get a low tip, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? Oh, you feel sad because you think you didn't do a proper job and you feel kind of upset because you think, uh, oh, I, didn't, I wasn't good enough for them. And that's why you try next time to be better. And when you get a high tip, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Oh, to kiss the customer and say thank you. <laughs> that's a good one. Like I connected with the customer probably very well. Uh, all the stuff that I'm going to buy when I get home, <laughs> to be honest. What do you think about restaurants that make their employees wear misogynistic uniforms? Um, I think it's a bad thing, you know, just because they're going to get tipped now based on what they look like, not on how well they do their job, and it shouldn't be based on that. It should be based on, you do, do your job and do your job well. I've been to Hooters as a customer, and yes, it's kind of sleazy, but uh, here we're very well dressed. I don't like that. I think that restaurants that make their employees wear misogynistic uniforms are crazy, like Hooters. I don't know why the girls have to wear stuff like that. You know, I understand that sex sells, but in certain things like that, you know, just wear regular clothes. I don't see the whole, I don't see the whole point in that. I wouldn't want to be wearing skimpy clothes as a man, so I wouldn't want my coworkers that are women to be doing that.
Hi, this is Christina. And this is Anju from YRU. And you're listening to CJRU at 12.80 a.m. Andrew and I attended a screening of the documentary We Can't Make the Same Mistake Twice and we had the honor of recording the Q&A session. We Can't Make the Same Mistake Twice was produced by Elenisa Abomswin. She is a film producer who documents the lives and struggles of First Nation people. What is the update since January 2016, which was when the course case ended? I must say I'm watching like all of you. <laughs> It's been a year, almost, so the money didn't seem to come for the needs, but obviously they have not obeyed the order from the tribunal. So despite that, the fight continues, is basically where we're at. I found it disappointing that not much has been done since the court case has ended. And there's no information about how the government is going to better the services and funding provided to First Nations children on reserve. I guess that we just have to wait to see what they're going to do next and what they're going to do to compensate for their actions. This is more of like an acknowledgement, yes, this did happen. However, I think we can do better than just words. It was a very long process as as we covered everything in the courtroom. And it's really historical because it's the first time that we've been allowed to actually film a case inside the courtroom. The students really are our main concern. We want this film to be available for education. If an Indian would end up in the, the university, we'd have to deny his race, let go of his status, meaning if he has a house or any property on the reserve, have to part with it and become a Canadian citizen, then he could be admitted to the university. Yeah, I think this film would make a great educational piece. I think this documentary will be really insightful into the child welfare system and the residential schools and the issues, how they've translated to present day. Well, I think this is an insightful way for people to know about it and to, to see it visually and to have a piece of what they went through. I just want to know, is there anything in particular or general that you would like to see changed in the act, specifically in the sections related to First Nations, Métis, and Inuit children? What we want is what we have been asking for since 1985, when the Child and Family Services Act finally got a little piece in there around First Nations and Aboriginal children. However, having spoken a little bit to a few people who've been involved in the process, I'm not that hopeful. That means we have to fight until it it is different because everybody can help. In my opinion, we've done it all wrong. We've got a Child and Family Services Act that has the same legislation and policies that applies to everybody. What I think should have been done, we should have first created an Aboriginal Family and Child Services Act, and then from there, we would be able to have the services that First Nations people truly want. They want to see uh, justice, and more and more Canadians at large are getting educated in terms of the real history of this country. I want to tell you that I feel so privileged to have had the support to do this film from the National Film Board of Canada. To hear more content from YRU, or to find out how to get involved with the show, you can contact the Provincial Advocates Office through email at advocacy at provincialadvocate.on.ca or email the station at admin at scope at ryerson.ca. The following is a clip from an interview with Erwin Elman, the Ontario Provincial Advocate for Children and Youth, that aired during the YRU Funding Drive episode in October 2016. Uh, we know that you tweeted about the ratio of marginalized, racialized uh, kids in care. Why don't you talk about that quickly? Especially in the GTA, far and away um, over represent. I think the stats are somewhere in the neighborhood of 40% um, of young people in care uh, are black. And some of the child welfare agencies in the GTA in Toronto. And obviously that's a problem. And the study that we were involved in started to begin to talk about what that's about, what's the experience of, of black youth who don't, do come into care, what's the experience of black families with child welfare, how can this be prevented? And from my point of view, I probably tweeted something about this, because um, you can ask me anyway, uh, that's about racism, pure and simple. Mm-hmm. I mean, there, 
in my mind and and uh, I think from young people's mind there's nothing else that can explain it it's about systemic racism that one group uh, particularly in Toronto are so immensely overrepresented overrepresented in the in the system so we're on the cusp of a moment to change and the the minister said well he said something like we all know there's racism in Ontario and that was his launching point to talk about what the director was going to do. And for me, I think, I'm not sure we all know that. And I, I don't think we should just be flippant about it and say, we all know. I think that's a harder piece of work we have to do. And in order to do that, I think we have to listen to the people who endure it. And I think, so my job is to say, we have to listen to the young people endure it and only then after we listen as a province can we say we all know there's racism in Ontario and only after we say that can we decide what we're going to do about it so for me I look for the province and the, even the premier to take some leadership on that and it's not good enough for me to say we all know it's important for the premier to say it exists we know it exists we have to talk about it. We have to find a way to talk about it. And first and foremost, we as a province need to listen. And then we need together, with the communities involved, to decide on a path forward to eradicate it. That's the privilege I have, is to hear these young people fill me up with knowledge of their lived experience and wisdom. It, uh, I, ha I have amazing jobs. So creating the opportunity for others to hear it too is how I think of it um, and I think young people benefit from it too but not more than the province does and I always think about the debt the province owes to people like Cody and Annika and others in my mandate who are willing to talk speak out it's not easy we're talking about um, marginalized communities in uh, Canada it's really difficult to not talk about um, indigenous communities mm -hmm. and um, more specifically um, about uh, all the media attention over the past, I think, what is it, year or two years about um, Aboriginal youth suicide. Mm -hmm. um, now, this is just a personal perspective. Uh, mm -hmm. Having I grew up in northern Ontario or like the northwestern Where? region, of, uh, close to Fort. Like I grew up in Fort Francis. Okay. And for me, having grown up, you know, in a in much closer proximity to Indigenous communities. Yep. Um, I remember seeing in the media a lot of people talking about like an uptick or an upswing in the amount of, uh, or even like the trouble that um, indigenous communities and especially indigenous youth have been um, suffering. But for me, having like grew up around there, it just seems more like people are paying attention as opposed to there being an upswing. Um, what do you think about that? Do you mean more people are paying attention to the issue, indigenous issues? Yeah, more issues? people are paying attention to the issue, as opposed to like what I've been, what I was seeing in the media over the past few years, where it seemed like they were just talking about it as if like it was a burst, like it just all of a sudden started to happen. Oh, like right. Whereas you know, like growing up, I there, understand. I know differently. Young people told me in, in when I've visited Fort Francis or mm -hmm. further north, uh, particularly in the communities, say north of Thunder Bay, that you can only get to through by mm -hmm. plane you know they we call them in on in the south remote communities mm -hmm. and i i think the young people said yeah you call us remote communities but actually toronto's remote to us mm -hmm. you're the remote community mm -hmm. and it just a way of looking at it and i think in the south we haven't known very much remember gord downey talking about it right from tragically up saying uh, in a, some ways saying he didn't know and when he found out he decided to do something about it and I think in the south we didn't hear media didn't pay much attention is that systemic racism going back to that probably why is one child worth paying attention to and another not I mean for years it you're right it's been decades Hun well we know hundreds of years and and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission painted as a, a, a damning picture of the history Canada's had with its indigenous people. So I do think it's true more people are paying attention. What I worry about is that paying attention is not the same as listening. Paying attention is not the same as doing something. 
I often think, you know, in this age where we have, um, we have, we have, I was, I watched CNN. So I did watch the debate last night. I watched CNN talking heads. And it was no offense to the journalists in the room, but it's always interesting that you have three hours of journalists talking to each other about what we just witnessed. And that's news. As if that's doing something. So watching CNN, watching the debate, seems like it's doing something. But it's not doing anything. It's not even really listening in some ways. And it's not challenging and dialogue. It's So I worry that now that the Gore Downey has made us be more aware, we think we've done something. And we haven't yet. I don't even think we've had the real dialogue and listening that we need to have. We need to get to a point where we agree to take action and find a path forward. And that's, if any, criticism of our government, because our government has been saying, our federal government has been saying very nice words, and that is welcome. I often think about the young people who are struggling in the North or in, in, in the many First Nations communities who have trying to find the courage to hope. Like that takes some courage when you are part of a legacy that every time something that might have seemed like hope in terms of your relationship with the rest of Canada got dashed. And now we have a federal government saying very nice words, sunny ways. And young people are wanting and daring and finding the courage to hope. But we need to act soon. It's a year since this government's been elected. And I, I know in um, Pekanjikum, or um, recently, I'm trying to remember the community, maybe I shouldn't name it, but in a, a community in, Ont in Ontario's north, children have died. I know um, what's happening in our western provinces. If you read a 10-year-old this week committed suicide in a community, and it's a year later from this government and its talk about sunny ways. And I think for the children and youth in my mandate who are daring to hope, that hope can be dashed really quickly without action. And so, yes, if our federal government continues to listen, I think that's important. If we as citizens continue to reach out and listen, I think that's really important. But there needs to be action. But I'm not sure we value children the way we should in the province. I think that when we make a statement about there's no money for, when we don't commit to children... Ha so when I said children should have what they... and youth should have what they need when they need it, I think about those kids with autism. It's not about a funding envelope, which really was that decision was about. Got so much money, we got this big wait list, what are we going to do? It's not a... it shouldn't be about that. It should be about... What do these children need? How are we going to make sure it's provided to them? Whether they're 5 or 4 or 6 or 10 or 12 or 16 or and 18 and then apparently they go to adult services, which doesn't work, the transition to adult services because some of the kids who need these services end up in in uh, seniors' homes. They're in a... I've seen it. They're in a, a, a very good home that's well supported through a children's service system and then they have to leave at 18 because that's the way the system works and now they have nowhere to go. And they're ripped up away from a caring, loving, safe family. It's ridiculous. And why do we do that? Because we don't value children in the way we should and we don't value young people in the way that we should. I feel utterly powerless a lot of the time. I feel as though I... I feel as though, almost as though that I've lost my voice to speak about the things that um, are going on in the world around me and that are affecting me and that are the reasons why I'm in the sort of depression that I'm in now and I find it so debilitating. And when I say I want power, I, I want the um, systems around me to help me in that, to help me feel like I have agency over my life and agency yeah. over the world around me. Yeah because I just feel like I don't right now. And that's kind of, an, it's a little bit of a new experience for me. I, at 23 years old is somehow when I feel the least powerful in my life. And um, that's 
But yeah, but I, Jesus. but I, do, I have also said um, through this, uh, through being on Why Are You, that it, it that it does give me um, a sense of power and a sense of agency, and I do appreciate that so much. And I and I really and I I would love to never be able to let it go, but the way the the way this um, the world around me has been affecting me lately, I feel like I haven't even been able to wield it in the ways that I wished I. I had in the past little while, and hopefully I can change that in the future. That is really profound and hard to hear.